This is the DB1 Gold, a compact two-way speaker that's both designed and made in the UK by a company named PMC. Now, PMC has carved out an excellent reputation for building really effective studio monitors, but they don't come cheap, and what you're looking at right now is the entry into their lineup. So the big question is, can you take something that's meant for studio use and still get really good, enjoyable sound out of it for casual listening? Well, let's talk about that. Okay, so before I go over the details, let's get the obvious out of the way. The DB1 Gold has a very purpose-built aesthetic that not everybody is going to enjoy. But then again, it comes from a manufacturer that is literally named Professional Monitor Company. So it's right in line with what you would expect. Now the one thing that I think most of us can appreciate though is a little bit of history. And in the case of the DB1 Gold, it can trace its lineage all the way back to the early 90s, which is when PMC set out to develop this compact speaker that would have the world's smallest and most effective transmission line cabinet, which has led up to what you're looking at right now because the DB1 Gold is essentially an evolution of that original design. PMC said, hey, if it's not broken, why fix it? We're just going to improve it through the years. And that leads me to the details of the speaker. Starting on top with the tweeter, you're going to get a one inch soft dome tweeter from ScanSpeak. And what I like so much about this is this is the same tweeter that you're going to find in their higher end offerings, meaning that PMC doesn't treat the speaker like a lesser product just because it's the entry into their line, which is something that I can appreciate. Beneath that, we are going to have a five and a half inch woofer that's made mostly out of a paper material material that's both designed and manufactured by PMC in-house, meaning that it is not an off-the-shelf piece. Now, let's turn the cabinet around so you can take a look at the back. And while I do that, let's briefly go over what a transmission line design is. So if you were to take apart the speaker, what you're going to notice is a bunch of wood folds with acoustic material around it. It kind of looks like a maze for a mouse, but there's going to be a lot of benefits to this. Instead of having an empty cabinet with a port, what this allows you to do is, number one, it helps to control resonances that occur within the cabinet. And then on top of that, it allows for precise control over the tuning of this loudspeaker. The downside is that it's not cheap to manufacture, and plus you can't really do it in mass quantity, hence why the speaker can be kind of expensive at $1,500 a pair. Anyways, let's turn it back around. You are going to notice the exit vent, and the cool thing about a transmission line design is if you design it the right way, then the sound as it exits the port here is going to be in phase with the front of the speaker, which in turn is going to help with efficiency, particularly with lower frequencies. Beneath that, we are going to have a set of five-way binding posts in a bi-wireable configuration. And I think the last thing that I need to go over are the differences between the outgoing DB1i and the Golds. And essentially, there's no major difference. It's mostly aesthetic, which is fine by me. So now let's talk about how it sounds. Okay, so before I dive into all the details, the first and most important thing that you need to know about the DB1 Gold is that it was designed with near field applications in mind, meaning that it tends to sound best in a desktop environment where your ears are only maybe a few feet from the loudspeakers. That is when the value proposition is very obvious. However, once you take it outside of that environment, you put it on a set of stands, you sit maybe six or so feet away from the speakers, that's when they start to sound every bit as small as they really are and thus the value proposition quickly begins to decline. So with that out of the way, now let's talk about how it actually sounds, starting with the character. So when you listen to the DB1 Gold, it's like listening to a speaker that's a fusion between that typical studio monitor sound and a hi-fi loudspeaker. On the studio monitor side, it does a great job of spatial separation, hearing all those little details within the recording. It's very easy to pick out, and it's also pretty transparent. It does a really good job of showcasing what your gear and what your music really sounds like. But the only thing that really keeps it from being dry and analytical sounding is the fact that it actually has coloration to the sound. Even though it does come from more of a professional audio company, it doesn't have a completely flat frequency response. In fact, when you listen to it, you're going to notice a mild V curve, which isn't exactly unusual for a small monitor. The treble is going to be slightly accentuated, and then you're going to have a bump in the bass. I believe it's at around 120 or so hertz. And overall, what you're going to get is a speaker that has a lively, quick, light, and agile sound. So now let's dive into further detail by first going over the treble. 
Okay, so the bottom line is describing the high frequency performance of this speaker is actually very challenging because it's transparent and what you experience at home is going to hinge on a number of different variables. But still, at its core, what I think you can expect from the speaker is a top end that is going to be slightly accentuated. This is going to help to give it more of a lively and forward sounding character. But to be clear, it's not sharp or sibilant sounding. It doesn't go as far as, say, Focal and Kef does in that regard. Overall, I think the top end, it truly reminds me of the characteristics of a metal dome tweeter, only with soft dome charm. Let me explain what I mean. A lot of soft dome tweeters, especially at this price point, while they can be very smooth sounding and easy on the ears, the caveat with that is that when you listen to live unamplified music, you'll notice that a lot of soft dome tweeters really blunt the attack of an instrument. So when somebody is playing, let's say, a drum kit or they're strumming on a guitar, it doesn't really capture the leading edge notes very well. Whereas this speaker not only captures the leading edge notes with a good sense of realism, but it also captures the decay of those notes very, very well, almost like a good metal dome tweeter, except without that annoying ringing that tends to come with those tweeters. So the top end is very good. I would say that it's forgiving enough to where you can listen to poor recordings without being ran out of the room, but to be clear, it's not going to put a band-aid over them either. So it's this fine balance between, again, that hi-fi sound and that studio monitor sound. Now, let's talk about the mid-range. So the mid-range is interesting because I would like to say that it's fairly flat and neutral, but the problem is this. In a real-world environment, when you get a small speaker and you give it a slight V-curve, What's going to happen is that the mid-range is going to sound a little bit thin and that's exactly what happens here even in a near-field environment. It sounds like there's just a little bit of a thinness within the upper mid-range between the tweeter and the woofer and in a way this helps to give the sound a big sense or I would say a great sense of depth like there's layering within the sound stage. On the flip side though it doesn't have that same fullness that you would get out of say a much more expensive Harbeth P3 ESR, which is a comparison that I'm gonna to get to later on in this video. But still, what you're gonna get is something that like the top end is gonna be airy and spacious sounding. It's gonna be very quick, very detailed. And because it uses what I consider to be a very natural material for the woofer, it still has good tone. Now don't get me wrong, female vocalists can sound a little bit nasally at times, especially in poor recordings, but nonetheless, it's very pleasant to listen to, especially once your ears adjust to the presentation. And now let's talk about the bass. So the bass for a small speaker is actually very good. I mean, this is one of the benefits of a transmission line. Now, there is gonna be that coloration, that 120 hertz or so bump. In a near field environment with room gain, it becomes a little bit more pronounced. For some people, that'll be a problem. For others, it'll actually be a good thing, so it just depends on how you like your bass. But overall, I would say it's good, but don't expect miracles out of this speaker. It's still very, very small. I think what's more impressive is the power handling. I mean, this is a speaker that can get pretty loud for its size and still remain composed, which is very impressive. Another impressive thing is going to be its dynamic range or its dynamic output. So a lot of small speakers, especially cone and dome speakers, this is when they tend to completely fall apart, right? As soon as the music gets dynamic, you're reminded of how small the speaker really is. Well, in the near field environment, and even in more of a traditional environment, this speaker has a little bit of kick to the sound. And I think what's most impressive is how it handles micro dynamics. In other words, all those subtle little transitions that you hear in the music is just is handled so well. I'm almost tripping over myself here. So overall, I mean, this is a very good tell it like it is speaker that has a mix of coloration to the sound that'll keep everything interesting. So what I wanna do now is I'm gonna talk about the kind of gear that I feel pairs up very well to this speaker. So let's talk about that. Okay, so this section is gonna be nothing but good news. Even though these are very transparent speakers, by which I mean they do a really good job of showcasing what your components actually sound like, they're not particular about the kind of gear that they pair up well to, meaning that you can connect them to pretty much anything, maybe short of a three watt SET amplifier, and you're going to get good sound. And best of all, you don't need to spend a lot of money in order to really enjoy what they can do. For example, throughout the majority of this evaluation, I was using the IOTA VX SA3 integrated amplifier, which retails for just over 500 bucks. And quite frankly, that match dollar for dollar was absolutely fantastic, and I think it's something that a lot of people will be satisfied with. Now, don't get me wrong, as you spend more money, you can get better performance, 
but it's not necessary to get an overall really good sound out of those speakers, particularly in a desktop environment. Now it's time to talk about power. So these speakers are rated at being 87 dB in terms of power sensitivity, which isn't really that efficient, but when you look at the impedance behavior, especially the fact that it has an eight ohm nominal load, these in the real world are actually very easy to drive. So in a desktop environment, you do not need any more than 30 watts per channel from a conventional solid state amplifier. If you like big dynamic range, you may wanna step it up to say 50 or 60 watts per channel. In more of a traditional two channel application, I would say you wanna be in the 50 plus range, but by and large, these are very easy speakers to drive. So anyways, like I said, Almost nothing but good news here, but not everything is good news about these speakers, so now it's time to go over the caveats. All right, so I'm gonna keep this section short and sweet because I already went over the main caveats already. So just to summarize everything once again, number one, these are small application-based speakers. They were meant for a near-field desktop environment. That's where they sound best. And when it comes to value at $1,500, it makes sense to buy something like this if you're looking for a really good, dare I even say, a final desktop solution, something to settle down with over the long haul. However, once you take these little speakers and you put them in more of a traditional hi-fi setup, that's when the value proposition quickly begins to dive because quite frankly, in that situation, there are a lot of speakers for that money and especially even lower that will take them to task. Beyond that, you have its sound profile that not everybody is going to like. It has that lively, airy presentation. There is gonna be that bump in the bass at around 120 or so hertz that not everyone's gonna like. Some people are gonna want a fuller, warmer presentation, but at this point in the review, you probably already know if it's for you or not. So having said that, that leads me to my final thoughts. <laughs> Okay, so to wrap this up, the DB1 Gold, in my opinion, is a very niche solution. It's gonna be for somebody who says, hey look, I want a set of high quality monitors for my desktop rig. I want something that's like a fusion between your honest studio monitor sound, yet I want it to be entertaining like a traditional hi-fi speaker. If that's what you're looking for and these are within your budget, then I think you are gonna be very, very satisfied with these speakers. However, if you wanna use something like this in more of a traditional application, I think your money can go further with many other solutions. So having said that, that's gonna be my take on the DB1 Gold. Stick around if you're interested in how it compares to something like the Harbeth P3 ESR. I'm gonna have that in the bonus section. Otherwise, as usual, thanks for watching and until next time, peace. Okay, so before I get to the comparison, I need to make this crystal clear. I know there's gonna be a lot of people asking me how the PMC is compared to this laundry list of products, so let me make this easy for you. If you have a budget of $1,500 and you're looking for a really good set of desktop speakers, go with these. If you have a budget of $1,500 and you want something for your bedroom or something for more of a traditional hi-fi setup, unless you really, really like what I had to say about the golds, you're probably gonna be better off going with something else. There it is. So now it's time to talk about how the PMC Golds compare to the Harbeth P3 ESRs. And this is gonna be a fun comparison for a lot of reasons. Number one, both speakers are designed and made in the UK. Both of them sound best in a desktop environment. Both of them actually share a rich lineage dating back many decades. And what's also cool is that both speakers use an outsourced tweeter, but use woofers that are designed and manufactured in house. So how do they compare sound-wise? Well, the short of it is this. The PMCs have a lighter, airier sound. They image better. They lay down a wider sound stage with slightly better focus in between the speakers. I would say they're also slightly, and I mean ever so slightly better with spatial separation. The sound is quicker. And overall, you're just gonna get more of an immediate presentation out of the PMCs. However, the Harbests, which by the way, are a lot more expensive. They're literally, I think in Rosewood finish, the P3 ESR is nearly $1,000 more money, $2,500 to be precise. But what you're gonna get is a product that is incredibly well built. I mean, when you look at this, when you hold it, I mean, it just screams heirloom quality, something that you can pass down from generation to generation. And don't get me wrong, the PMC is not trash, but by comparison, it's not even in the same league in terms of build quality. Now, when it comes to 
performance, the Harbeth is going to be smoother. It's going to be more forgiving. The mid-range is going to be larger sounding, in my opinion, more natural sounding. And the bass output is actually going to be just as good as the PMC, if not even slightly better and more useful and more of a traditional two-channel application. So that's going to be the general breakdown. What do you want? Do you want something that's forgiving with that nice, warm, natural tone to it with decent bass? Of course, you know, you're going to pay a lot more money for it. Or do you want something that's more lively, lighter sounding, and a little quicker sounding? It's all up to you. Anyways, guys, that's going to be my take on this comparison. As always, thanks for watching, and until next time, peace.